Amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Can you spare some change? Can you spare some change? If I can draw your attention to verses 1 and 3 of Matthew chapter 18. In verse 1 it says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked him, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And in verse 3 it says, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Can you imagine the boldness to ask Jesus who is the greatest? Can you imagine the boldness to ask Jesus, can you be the greatest in the kingdom? If Jesus walked in here right now and stood in front of you, would you ask him who's the greatest? Would you want to know are you the greatest? Or would you just be glad to be in the number? <laughs> just glad to be in the house of God. I'm just glad to be around this thing. I don't know if I even want to ask the Lord, am I the greatest? The truth of the matter is I already know I'm probably not. I'm climbing up on the rough side of the mountain. I'm just doing my best to make it in. I guess I'm by myself, but to ask God, can I be the greatest in the kingdom? Can I sit at your right hand or your left hand when you come to your kingdom? Can I be the greatest? The boldness to want to know who's the greatest and can I be the greatest? Listen, I'm just trying to come to church. I'm just trying to praise. I'm just trying to love. I'm just trying to worship God. I'm just trying to love that woman. I'm just trying to raise these teenagers, help us, Jesus. I'm just, uh, try, I'm just trying to get my, my financial legacy together. I'm just trying to do my thing. I don't know if I'm thinking about being the greatest. I don't know if that's something I am almost admire the courage to ask Jesus, yeah, I want to be the greatest. If Jesus came in here and asked you, what do you want? I bet you'd ask for a whole lot of stuff besides I want to be the greatest. In the kingdom, I, the boldness to ask, can I be the greatest in the kingdom? It reminds me of, of several, several years ago. This was uh, not, too, not too recently, but several years ago, maybe, maybe seven, eight, maybe nine years ago uh, here in North Carolina, they made me go to drive in school. Anybody ever have to go to drive in school? No, you don't have to raise your hand. Folks like that. No. Might have to go. But they make you go to drive in school. Get too many speeding tickets, and, and you get in too much trouble, and then they suspend your license. Then one of the ways to get it back, one of the ways for your number, your things not to be too high, whatever, is that they make you. And I, I got to a point where it wasn't just about knocking points off my license. It was, I wasn't going to be able to get it back unless I went. It's me, Pastor Andy. And while it was suspended, I still drove. Don't judge me. I need the blood too. But but it was suspended. And so to, and and of course my wife is like, honey, you gotta stop driving with a suspended license. And so my assistant looked it up, figured out what I was gonna have to do. She said, you have to go to driving school. I said, Can you go for me? She said, No, you're gonna have to go. I was gonna send somebody else. No, you gotta take your ID and you gotta go, you gotta sit there, and you gotta be there all day on like a Saturday. All day. It was brutal. I remember while I was sitting there, and I'm in the room, I'm sitting in the back, I'm scared somebody's going to notice me. Like, excuse me, aren't you bad? I'm sitting in the back, I got shades on, I got a hat on, and I'm, I'm just kind of there incognito. I'm there, I'm not trying to let anybody know it's me, I'm in the back. And so the teacher asked a question, it was a woman that was teaching the class, and she said, how many people, at the very beginning, she said, how many people here think that you're an excellent driver? Raise your hand. 75% of the people raised their hand. Excellent driver. My hand was down. She said, how many people here think that you're a pretty good driver? You think you're a pretty good driver? Raise your hand. And the most, just about everybody else in the room raised their hand. I didn't raise my hand. So she noticed that I didn't raise my hand. And she pointed at me. She said, sir, yes, you in the back with your head down. Yes, can you, can you lift your veil? Yes, you. <laughs> she said, why didn't you lift your hand? She said, I've been teaching this class for almost 14 years. I've never been in a class in which I asked this question, and a man didn't raise his hand. Why didn't you raise your hand? 
And I said, how can I think I'm an excellent driver when I'm in driving school? If I was so good, why am I here? Am I the greatest? Listen, I'm just glad I'm saved. I'm just glad he's still using me. I'm just glad he didn't strike me the last time. I'm just glad that his hand is still on me for good. I, I, half the time I'm saying, Lord, don't be far from me. Half the time I'm saying, Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. I'm almost scared to talk too much junk about what he's doing in my life because I'm afraid that in my pride he'll lift his hand from me. And I, I was raised just to feel condemned all the time. And I, to be the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus' response was greatest, listen, unless you change. You can't even enter the kingdom unless you change. Y'all sitting here talking about being the greatest. I'm not even sure y'all are in. You need to worry about whether you're even in or not. You sitting here asking about greatness. I ain't mad at you about greatness. But instead of asking about who's the greatest, you need to ask me what is the price of admission for the kingdom. And to even get in, you're going to have to change. Change. Tell somebody you know, change. Someone you know, tell someone you know, not a stranger. Look at somebody you know, tell them change. If you don't know nobody in this room, introduce yourself to somebody. In the don't be in church all by yourself. Turn to someone you know. Come on, turn to someone you know. Tell them change. Oh, don't say it too loud to your husband now. <laughs> change! <laughs> say change. Just subtly, just change. Change. That word change is, uh, uh, that, that word change there, uh, uh, the, the way that, the, that what the Bible is actually saying, and I'm going to give you a couple of ways to see that word change, but the first meaning, the biblical meaning is to be converted. It's a, it's a Greek word, strepo, to be converted. He says, unless you be converted, unless you repent, Unless you turn, unless you see one way you're going and you repent and you are converted and you decide to turn from going one way and going in another way. In other words, the kingdom is not in the direction that you're going when you're in your sin. On your way to hell, you're not on your way to the kingdom. For you to go to the kingdom, you're going to have to take a different exit than what you've been on. For you to get into the kingdom, you're going to have to turn to get into the kingdom. Unless you be converted, unless you repent, unless you turn, you will never enter the kingdom, is what Jesus says. Change. You're going to have to be converted. You're going to have to repent. You're going to have to turn to change. You're going to have to say, I'm sorry. You'll have to say, I'm sorry, God. You may have to say, I'm I'm sorry to your children. You may have to say, I'm sorry to your wife. You may have to say, sorry to your husband. You may have to say, sorry to your boss. You may, you may have to say, sorry to your parents. How can you say sorry to a God you don't see and can't say, I'm sorry to a wife you do see? How can you say, I'm sorry to a God you can't see and can't say sorry to your teenager who you do see? How can you say sorry to God that you don't see and can't say, I'm sorry to your parents who you do see? Unless you change, unless you repent, change your mind, you will never enter the kingdom. It's the first, it is what the biblical meaning is of the word change. But for English speakers, I'm going to take a little liberty with the word change. And I'm going to make the word change mean some other things. I already admit for all of you scholars and, and, and those who are looking for proper exegesis, I get it. I told you what the biblical tr translation is. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of liberty with the, with the passage based on the English language and, and develop it a little bit more for you to know what I mean when I say change, when Jesus says, unless you change. Because a second way that we think of change, and the little picture that they had for this sermon reflects it, is that change 
is the currency returned when you give too much. Change is the currency return when you give too much. When you overpay, you expect to get change. So when you overpay, you expect to get change. God gave his son to die for you. He gave a currency that was too much. He expected to get some change back. Oh, help us, Holy Ghost. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. He gave too much. He expects change in return for overpaying. He expects some change. Okay, I thought that was a good point, but I'll move on. The third thing that I mean when I say change in the word English, the English word change means is that the English word means, a change means outer adjustment determined by environment. Outer adjustment determined by environment, meaning that if you're coming home from work and you're getting ready to go out with some friends, you change. The environment dictates that your outer is changed. You change your outer. You make an outer adjustment determined by the environment that you're in. The way you dress when you go to church is not the way you dress when you go to the club. No, you're not supposed to go to the club. Yeah, the way you dress when you go to church is not the way you dress when you're, you're the way you dress when you go to work. It's not the way that you dress when you go to the beach. Since your environment has changed, then you change the outer as a result of. The difference in the environment. I put on a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I come to God. I come to the church. I come to the house. And even if I don't feel it, I'll put praise on because the environment dictates that what I have on on the outside is different than what I have on other times. Whether I feel like it or not, I'll still change my clothes. If, it's too, if I go out and it's too cold, I go back in and I get a jacket on because the environment has determined outer change. So there's an outer adjustment that has been determined by the environment. And then number four is fourth way to change that's connected to the third one. And that is changes inner adjustment determined by experience. Inner adjustment determined by experience, meaning that because of what you went through, you changed. You had an experience and it changed you. Anybody ever have an experience and it changed you? I asked the question. Anybody ever have an experience and it changed you? Anybody ever go through something and you said, okay, that's it. I am never going to do that. I am never going in there again. I am never going to experience it. That is the last time I'm doing that. And you shifted in the inside because of something that happened in your experience. And you made an inner adjustment as a result of an experience that you had in this world. You changed. Jesus is saying, unless you change. Now, I know the word change can give us different feelings, and we all can have reactions, different reactions to the word change. And I know that some of us can even be afraid of the word change. I know when someone says, you need to change, look at somebody you know and say, you need to change. That is weak. I said, look at somebody you, need, you know and tell them, you need to change. Look at somebody you don't know and say, you need to change. See, you, it, it doesn't have as much power because you don't know that they need to change. When you was looking at your man, you was, you was, you was talking truth. When someone says you need to change, there's a part of you that gets a little defensive about change. There's a part of you that is saying, what's wrong with me how I am? I thought it was just as I am without one plea for that. I thought I was supposed to be all right just the way I was. The Lord is like, yep, you are. You can come to me just the way you are. But if you stay, I'm going to help you change because I love you too much to leave you in the state I found you. 
I know somebody in a nine o'clock knows that that's the truth. I might buy it as is, but I'm not going to leave it as is. I'm going to fix it up. When I get done, it's going to be worth more than it was when I got it. And as a result of God getting you, he has worked on you. He has fixed your shocks. He has fixed your brakes. He has shined up your bumper, baby. And now you have gone up in the Kelly Blue Book. You are worth more than you were worth when he got you, when he found you, when he's done with you. Everybody wants you. Didn't nobody want you till the Lord got you. He loves you too much to leave you the way that you are as a result of his love for you. But I understand that when someone says change, when your husband says you need to change, when your wife says you need to change, when your parents say you need to change, when a teacher says you need to change, when your boss says you need to make a change, when God says you need to make a change, when the pastor says we need to change. I sit down with the worship team and say we need to change. I sit down with the pastoral team and say we need to change. People get nervous over the word change why does that word scare us why does the word change make us uncomfortable why would you avoid change let me give you several reasons why you would avoid change and I and just just speaking from just life and experience and just looking at my own self why would you avoid change why is it that change doesn't really happen as much why do people avoid change one of the first reasons why you avoid change is ignorance Ignorance. You think you're fine the way you are. Your ignorance. It's ignorance. You think you're fine the way you are. And it's one of the saddest things that there are people who limit their exposure so that they won't be inspired to change. They think they're the best mom that there can be because they've limited the amount of moms they've been around, they think they're being the best wife they can be and they almost don't want to be around a better wife. They almost don't want to be around a better husband because that will mess with their attitude about what they're doing. They almost don't want to be around a couple that's too happy because if you get around a couple that's too happy and you're not happy, it makes you realize how you're not happy. Then they get on your nerves. They just got on my nerves. I'll smooching and kissing and holding hands and just, I love you, you love me. What is all that? Isn't that bothering you? People hate because it shows that they don't quite have what they think they have. And if they are exposed to too much truth, they will have to change. That's why people don't like new people. That's why people don't like to read. Because if I read, I might find out that I'm not as smart as I think I am. And I don't want to go to nobody else's church conference. I don't want to go. to. I want to stay in my little denomination and my little people and have my little experiences. Because if I go somewhere else, then what may happen is they may cause discontent in me. And I fought too hard to get here to now be unhappy about it. I'm dropping a word. So I'm staying ignorant on purpose. I don't want to talk to anybody else. I don't want to have a conversation with it. I don't want to be confronted. I don't want to sit down with anyone. I don't want nobody to tell me nothing. Leave me alone. I don't feel like going up to that church. They're too in my business. And I need to be allowed to stay as ignorant as possible so that I can be all right with the less I have in comparison to the more I could have if I simply grew. I really didn't expect to spend this much time on this, son. Second reason why people avoid change is the second reason people avoid change is pride. Pride. People will know that you're not perfect. You know what's amazing to me is the expectation of perfection. There's no such thing as perfect. You need to tell somebody that. Tell them there's no such thing as perfect. Oh, help us, Holy Ghost. If you got to tell it to a chair, tell it to a chair. Say, hey, chair, there's no such thing as perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect church. 
There's no such thing as a perfect pastor. I thought she was the perfect pastor. No, I'm not. I'm telling you now. No such thing as a perfect wife. See, nobody wanted to say amen on that one because they, they're like, come on, Pastor Andy, hold that down. No such thing as a perfect wife. No such thing as a perfect husband. Hear that? That's right. <laughs> no such thing as a perfect husband. Ain't nowhere near nothing close to no perfect teenager. Oh, help us, Holy God. I guess you don't have one yet. No such thing as a perfect house. No such thing as a perfect car. No such thing as perfect service. You can't be mad when the flight's delayed. It's not perfect. Who told you it was going to be perfect? There's no such thing as a perfect you. You are always growing. I want everybody to clap on that. You are always growing. If you are not growing, then you are dead. This is me. This is who I am. You're dead. The only way you stop growing is that you die. And so it ought to be easy for you to say, yep, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm getting better. Please be patient with me. I'm on my way. Who I am today is not who I'm going to be tomorrow. I'm on my way to another place. You ain't got to worry about me. I hear you. It ain't even difficult. I don't even get defensive. I'm like, yep, yeah, you're right. I am far from perfect. If somebody says to you, would you do that differently? You ought to be like, yes, most definitely. I, I don't even like to think too much about the past because I get mad at myself when I was 30. You have, to be, you have to be patient with me when I talk to you when you're 30 because I'm not really mad at you. I'm mad at me. Oh, I wish I had a way. You have to say to your teenager, I'm sorry. I don't mean to yell at you. I'm really yelling at myself because I wish that somebody had told me this when I was 15. And really, it's really, you really aren't that bad. Really, who I'm mad at is I'm mad at me at 16. Pride. People have pride. And people like to front. Like they've got it all together when nobody in here got it all together. People like to front like they don't never get sad when everybody in here knows what it means to feel sad. People like to front like they don't ever make no mistakes when every single person in here has made a mistake. Oh, can I please get a witness in the... Every person in here has made a mistake. A couple of weeks ago, I started talking about the Kavanaugh thing. I barely don't even want to talk about it. I've got some letters. and Please, please, please understand I'm not being insensitive to sexual abuse. My wife was sexually abused for years. So I'm not insensitive to, to the plight of the woman that's been sexually abused or the man that's been sexually abused. I'm not insensitive to it. I'm not. Uh, and for, forgive me if you think that I came off insensitive. I'm not. I, you just have to understand I'm in the redemption business. I'm in the redemption business. I just want to give people another chance. I'm not saying he deserves another chance. I'm just saying I want to give people another chance. I'm not making less of what he was accused of doing. See, I got to leave it now because folks are getting quiet. I have to, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I have to be careful talking about it too much. But, but the problem is that there's a ditch on either side of the road. But my point is, is, is that I, I have to acknowledge that I need grace and mercy. People avoid change because they think if people see them change, then that's, an, that's admitting that who you were wasn't so great. But why is that hard to do? Everybody in here ought to be able to say, oh, yeah, who I am today is nothing in comparison to who I'm going to be tomorrow. And if you can't say that, you have too much pride. And you better be careful because the word says that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And if you don't humble yourself, God will humble you. I remember when I was younger, people were accusing me of being prideful. You're so arrogant. You're so prideful. You're so arrogant. And I just was like, maybe I am. So I just started praying, saying, Lord, humble me. And the Lord spoke to me and said, don't ask me to humble you. You need to humble yourself. Because if I humble you, you're going to be humbled. When I get done, you'll be humbled. 
I said, that's right, my bad, Lord, my bad. I humble myself in the sight of the Lord so you can lift me up in due season. Never mind, never mind, cancel that. Never mind, never mind, never mind. Number three, third reason why people avoid change. That's all I'm going to get to. Third reason why people avoid change is shock, awe. You have never seen it. It's totally foreign to you. You've been on the planet a long time, and you ain't seen a lot of change. Change is so foreign. Change is so different. Change is so rare that we almost don't expect any kind of change. What do you mean change? We see somebody that lost a lot of weight, and our assumption is that they're sick. Oh, nobody wants to say amen on that one. That's the truth. People, somebody saw me recently, and they were like, oh, you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just trying to be 50 and hot. <laughs> Can I get a witness in the Somebody showed me a picture of Will Smith, and I was like, the devil is a liar. <laughs> There's no way Will and Jada are going to be outdoing me and LaShawn. Right, babe? Right, right? We're trying. Right, okay. What I'm saying is, but it's change is so rare that if somebody changes, we think something happened. It's so foreign that we don't, we're not used to it. And we think, oh my God, you have cancer. Oh my God, something's happened to you. Oh my God, what is going on with you? How did you lose all this weight? What is wrong? Are you okay? Because we're just not used to seeing anyone change. If you're someone that is totally different than who you used to be, and I am somebody that's totally different than who I used to be. When I go back to my high school reunion, they're like, you have, <laughs> it's funny when people say, people are following you. And I'm like, yep. I was never no captain or nothing. What happened to you? Anybody ever say that? What happened to you? Oh, my God. What happened to you? You ought to be able to say, my dungeon shook and my chains fell off. And I, the Lord got a hold of me. And who I was was not enough. And I realized I needed a change in my life. And I didn't go to church just to get a little Jesus. I went to church because I needed him to turn me upside down and fix some stuff so that you would not recognize me. And if it had not been for God in my life, I don't even know if I'd be alive right now. I wish I had a witness in here. Easy for me to praise him because he changed me. Who I used to be, I'm not that person anymore. way I used to go, I don't go no more. Stuff I used to do, I don't do no more. The way I used to talk, I don't talk no more. I'm different. And the fourth reason why people avoid change and why they don't change is because, they, because of the lack of instruction. You know how hard it is and you don't know the way. You know how hard it is, and you don't know the way. Have you ever had a conversation with someone who says, I just need to change. I just need to change, man. They acknowledge it's difficult. I just need to change, but I don't know how to change. I need to change, but I don't know the way. I need someone to give me some instruction on how change actually happens because I realize it's more than just going to church. But I'm at a point in my life where I recognize I need something to change. I need something to break. I need something to be different. I can't keep doing this thing the way that I'm doing it right now. Something's got to change. I need the Lord to break something off of me. I need the Lord to make a change. And something's got to be different. Something's got to happen. There's got to be something that the Lord does in my life. And somebody's going to have to teach me what are the steps to change. It's causing me to ask the question, how do I get to change? How do I get there? How do I get to a place where who I am is, is, is not what I used to be? How do I get to change? How does change actually take place? 
Starts with prayer. Starts with worship. Starts with acknowledging that you need to change. But how does that really happen? Once I make a commitment, once I pray, once I say, okay, Lord, come in my life, then what? Now what are the steps that I take? What is the way for me to get to actually change? How can I change my marriage? How can I change my business? How can I change this relationship? How can I change the direction that I'm going? How do I do it? And I've, I've got it right here. I've got seven steps to change. Problem is that I'm out of time. And you're going to have to come back and hear a word. Put your hands together if you heard a principle in here this morning. I want you to stand to your feet. I'm listening to the Holy Ghost and I'm wrestling. I feel compelled to do an altar call for change. The challenge is that if I do an altar call and say, how many people need the Lord to change something in them or for them? How many people are going to come? Raise your hand. See, that's just about everybody. It's just about everybody. So, I'm just going to make the whole room the altar. I'm going to make the whole room the altar. I'm not going to make you walk because we don't have room and you'd be all in the aisles. I'm going to make the whole room the altar. The other thing is that if I did an altar call for who needs change and who needs stuff to change, I'm going to be down here. And then who's going to pray? Because I need God to change some things in me. I need a witness in the building. I need the Lord to change some things for me. I got some people I need God to change. I got some situations I need God to change. So I want you to reach out and grab somebody's hand. I'm going to have to stand with you. Squeeze that person's hand just a little bit. Lord, we need some change in here. Somebody needs a miracle in here. If no one else, God, I need a miracle. I need a miracle. I need a miracle, Lord. My brothers and my sisters, we need a miracle. My brother Nate needs a miracle, God. My, my sister Ashley needs it. My brother Colin needs a miracle. The staff, Johnny, needs a miracle, God. Josh needs a miracle. The elders need a miracle. Quan needs a miracle. His teenagers need a miracle. <laughs> God, Michelle needs a miracle. My son Brian needs a miracle. My, my other son Brian needs a miracle. Who needs a miracle? Ron needs a miracle. Ernest needs a miracle. We're looking for a miracle. Every one of us in this room, we need a miracle. We need a touch. From you. We sang it this morning. Uh oh, uh, uh. we need a touch from you. God, we need a touch. We need you to make a way for us. We need you to change our minds. We, we need to change our bodies. There's somebody in this room right now that's terrified about what the tests are going to be, Lord, this week. They're, they need a miracle. Somebody's watching live, looking at the empty stage, thinking, who's praying? But God, we need a miracle. We need you to change something. We're asking you to change us. We're asking you to change our minds. We're asking you to change our hearts. We're asking you to change our whole financial situation. Make us the head and not the tail. Lord, we've been leasing these spaces, but we want to own something. And we don't want to be in debt to do it. Lord, we want to own our own homes and own our own cars. We want to leave an inheritance for our children's children. We want our wives to come back to us. We don't want our husbands to be found. 
we want you to bring the man that you have for these single women. The devil is a liar. Lord, we want you to bring the women that you have for these single men. Lord, we want you to create family in this place. Lord, we want you to bless them with children. My son Manny needs a miracle. He's preaching in Raleigh, but he needs a miracle. My daughters need a miracle. Stacy needs a miracle. Kayla needs a miracle. Thank you, God, that there's power in your blood. Would we be free? There's power in your blood. Thank you for living so big in us today. Thank you that you always hear us when we pray. Thank you for answering all of our prayers. Thank you that you said you would not be far from us. You're near us. Thank you for living so big in us today. Thank you for speaking to us and through us. Thank you for your word that is able to build us up. Dismiss us from this place. Confident in our miracle. We're looking to get a call tomorrow, God, about our miracle. We're looking for an answer this week, God, for our miracle. We're looking for you to change, not just stuff, but change us. Change my parents, change my cousin, change my brother. Do what only you can do, and we'll give you praise. Thank you for your power that's available to us. Thank you that there's glory in the room. Thank you that right now, we belong to you. Thank you that we're your children, the sheep of your pasture. We've entered into your gates with thanksgiving. We've come into your courts with praise. We've been thankful to you. We bless your name. Squeeze that person's hand just a little bit. Thank you, Lord God, right now for what you're doing in my brother and my sister. As you bless them, bless me. As you bless me, bless them. Thank you for change. In Jesus' name. Lord, as we always pray, bless your people. Make your face shine upon your people. Be gracious to your people. Give favor to your people. Give them peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. We all sit together. Can you just praise God in advance for your miracle really quickly?